comes is where I'm currently working. Uh, um, and Musana camps really is uh, eight, 1,000 acre camp, Christian campsite in Bikwe. And we really set ourselves up on the basis of biblical manhood and womanhood and how to resource and empower people to discover who they are as men and as women on a biblical basis. And everything we sort of we do a variety of things at the camp, but that's sort of the foundation of the heart, it's the core of our ministry. Before I get into it, um, just as a preamble, since we are doing this for primaries, I'll sort of split it so you can have an idea of what we'll be covering. Today's session, I hope we can just sort of do an introduction to what BMW is and also an introduction to what we mean when we talk about world use because we'll be addressing a lot of things in the weeks that come. And then the next session we'll have uh, will be into the authority of scripture as we talk about biblical um, worldview, biblical manhood and womanhood. Session three, we'll look into the pillars of manhood and womanhood. We'll split that into two sessions, sort of try and wrap it up with what your action points are. So as we get into the introduction to this whole BMW thing, I'd want to hear from you guys what comes to mind or what you think biblical manhood and womanhood is. Remember, we said it's interactive, so feel free to speak or to post something in the chat. And don't wait for someone else to do it. Whatever's in your mind, you can post. Then Natasha can read them out to us. All right, guys, feel free to unmute and make your answers known. I'm very patient and I will wait for at least two people to say something, then I'll move on. Yes, Natasha, your hands raised. Yeah, uh, the fastest thing that would come to me is biblical and gentleman uh, gendering or doing or being who we are in our different identities in a biblical way or in a way God approves all. Okay. That's good. I think Rebecca saying these are those breathing competitions where strangers call you and you refuse to say hello. I am very, very good at those. So when I say it's going to be interactive, I will actually just pause and let us all breathe for each other until someone says something. Moses Wandeva is saying man and womanhood as the Bible describes them, right? Cool. So we've got our two minimum and we can sort of jump ahead is this important is my next question because a lot of you have jumped onto this call you signed up to listen to it why is it important is it something important for you to i mean how many of you ever even sit and think what's the commandment and womanhood i think a good example is the question i asked and everyone just sort of doesn't have an answer because for a lot of us it's never really crossed our minds there are more important things to be thinking about bring about. So in this case, why would you think this particular thing is important? Douglas is saying uh, responsibility Douglas, according yeah. to the Bible. I think that's an answer to the previous question. My question is why would that be important?
Yes, God bless. Um, Your hands raised. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, it is uh, important as uh, it acts as a sort of a campus in terms of uh, responsibilities. And uh, yes, in our everyday lives, yeah, as men and women of God, that's what I think. Thank you. Douglas, thank you. Was someone saying uh, thank something? You, Enoch. Well? Thank you, Enoch. Thank uh, you, Enoch. My understanding for biblical womanhood and manhood and why it's important, I think it's for purposes uh, of us as as human beings in our different gender to know our roles according to the Bible and what we've been called for, just like you say, the responsibilities, but to to know what a man is meant to do, to know what a woman is meant to do. And yes, so that you can grow into that and act according to the word, as, as how the word is emphasizing it, and emphasizing our different roles. It's important for us to know our roles and the roles of different gender. Hey, Natasha, you want to go through some of the things coming up in the chat? So it is important because there are other definitions or rising definitions that seem contradictory. As Christians, our yardstick is the Bible and we ought to know in what parameters we are to operate as men and women. That's from Elijah and Moses one day. Awesome. Oh, um, I would like to point out a couple of things, and, and this is not a critique. So Elijah is saying it's important because there are other definitions or rising definitions that seem contradictory. And for us to believe they are contradictory, ideally that would mean there is a definition that you have, and the arising definitions are contradicting that definition. And the words that are coming out here, what I want to talk a little bit about. We are using words like yardsticks, we're using words like definitions, and all of these things. And so I want to ask to make a statement that I would want us to think about because it's what's going to sort of set the pace for a lot of us. And that statement is whoever provides definitions for you controls you. Those of you who are taking notes can note that down. Whoever provides definitions for you controls you. You don't need to get into your life to control everything else. They just need to be the authority figure that provides the definition for you. And in this case, if someone says this is what a man is, that's the definition they've provided. And subconsciously, that becomes a yardstick for you. And the funny thing with definitions most of us rarely examine definitions. Our reaction to a definition is simply we'll either accept it or we will reject it. And what that means is you either try to live up to that definition or you try to prove that definition wrong. Whichever direction you go, the person who's provided the definition is now controlling. He's in charge of you deciding whether to leave it out or to try and prove it wrong. Either way, that's the person in control. So I want us to back up again to say we are talking about manhood or womanhood. Why is it important? What I would say is before you're anything else in life, you first and foremost either a man or you're a woman. Before you're anything else. These days it's starting to get very muddled. We have the last time I checked, there were 18 different quote-unquote genders that were available. I actually have a friend here at camp who was applying to travel to a certain country and the list that used to have male or female, and in some cases male, female, or rather not mention, now had 18 different ones and he had no idea which one meant what. And you wonder how we've suddenly switched into that era just in the space of the last three or four years. The thing, though, that I was pointing out is your base definition of who you are, of your identity, the foundation, the very base place, 
if you're a man or a woman, when you walk into a room and look around, you see men and women. If you're a doctor, if you're a pastor, if you're a worship leader, if you're in primaries, if you're in all of these things, it's on the basis of you being a man or a woman. That's what you identify yourself as first and foremost. If you fail in life, if you're a doctor and you end up messing up, usually you're not failing as a doctor first and foremost. You're failing as a man or a woman. If you're a leader, for example, you're the, the president of a country and you fall prey to corruption, it is the man who is corrupt first before it is the president. A lot of our failures in life and our struggles in life come from that core foundation of being a man or a woman and trying to live up to definition. When God is calling us, he's calling men and women before he's calling pastors or prophets or any of these things. When we go back to Genesis, I will be studying that quite extensively in this course. When God creates people, he does not create worshippers, he does not create husbands, he doesn't create presidents, mechanics. First and foremost, he creates men and women. He creates a man and a woman as a very base level. And so when that foundation is unclear, everything else begins to crumble around that. And so that's why we believe that before we get to building all these other things we are building around ourselves in life, we have to understand what it means at the very basis to be a man or a woman because that's where the struggles come from. So really quickly, I want us to do a quick examination. When we talk about men, when we talk about women, we could talk about it globally, but I want us to localize it as much as possible. This is a question I would want to ask. What do we think is the state of manhood in Uganda? If you're describing what men are in Uganda, what the condition of being a man is in Uganda, how would you answer that? Like, What, what story would you tell? But again, hopefully we won't listen to each other breathing too long this time. Yes, Douglas. In Uganda, uh, what it means to be a man is uh, a, a, it is uh, a male, a male who can provide for their wife, their children. Eh? A man, okay, in Uganda, in the Ugandan context, someone someone who can who can uh, take responsibility of their family and so on someone who who works hard and so on that is the local context according to the ugandan according to our country uganda yes someone who is energetic and so on mm. not energetic in terms of muscle and what but yeah. Okay. So energetic handles his responsibility, male. I want to hear from one more guy, then I would want to also hear from one or two ladies as well. What's the state of, of, of manhood in Uganda? Not the definition, but the state condition. Sorry, Becky, say again, I don't think we had you properly. Well, I, I, I was saying, can you, can you ask the question again? Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to move to the next slide, sort of give us an idea, right? So there are a couple of statements there that just throw a picture, but I just do want to bias it. Now, these are a lot of things we see being thrown around. Um, some of them have not concluded them, but we can try and guess the end of that answer. Uh, a lot of times we talk about how men are the problem. There's a lot of 
women empowerment going on because men are creating problems everywhere. Um, and I could give you an example if I talk, if I made a statement like, you know, I was coming home last night, I found this drunkard on the road staggering, wanting to beat people. The truth is a lot of you have had that statement and in your head, you heard me describe a man. If you listen again to the statement I made, I did not mention any gender, I didn't use a he or a her. All I said is I met this drunkard on the road staggering around and they were trying to beat people. What comes into our head immediately is it's a man. If I said that, hey, um, um, I have a friend of mine who's really struggling, their spouse is beating them all the time and they really need help. In your head, the spouse is a man, the friend is a woman. There's no need to actually refer to the gender because in our minds and the state of manhood currently in Uganda is men are the problem. Some of those, I don't know if any of you can guess, but I can just answer them for you in the interest of time because we are trying to carry on. So I'm saying, yes, the thought of a man when it came to a drunkard. Um, banks, a report came out and a lot of banks do not want to lend money to men. Microfinance institutions, and some of you work in them, you would attest to this. The bias is to lend money to women because women are more likely to try and pay back the, the money. Men are not trusted to actually pay back the money. So the requirements for you, if you're a man, naturally is they'll need more proof to going to be reliable. Current percentage of men in Luzira stands at almost 80% and slightly above. People in not just Luzira, but a lot of the uh, prisons in Uganda are predominantly men. Same thing, unfortunately, goes to the people in men's mental institutions. The vast majority, almost 80% of the people in Butabika are actually men. Um, and that's the condition of manhood right now. The percentage of men struggling with pornography, who wants to guess what the percentage is in Uganda specifically? I need two guesses. Women. Women is not a percentage, was that Natasha? Auntie? Well, I think 70% of men are struggling with pornography. Anyone else? Do we think higher, lower? 25. 20. Moses thinks 25% are struggling with pornography. Well, it's higher than 25, maybe. According with Moses, maybe there are some who are not struggling, they've just accepted it's not a struggle anymore. But actually, the last statistics we are closer to the 60 70 percent mark of men who are struggling with pornography. But I saw a recent statistic from two years ago that in Uganda, and this one startled me in Uganda, the majority of consumers of porn are actually women, they've now surpassed men, there are more women viewing porn. But in terms of people struggling, percentage of men that are struggling with porn, it hits the 60-70% mark. If you look at atrocities in the region, Rwanda, genocide, Congo, northern Uganda, even globally, Germany, the majority of people committing all these atrocities, usually men. And even in our culture, we have all these sayings that describe women. Basically, you can't find a guy with one wife. A few years ago, I saw a billboard, um, I think it was something advertising how you need to check yourself uh, for your HIV status. And what they had done is they show this lady, the billboard, she's opened the bedroom door and her husband is sleeping in the bed. And I think she was just coming home, but the, the title of the billboard was basically saying, you never know where he has been, get tested. And that's the advertisement. But basically, like it's a given, men cannot be trusted. They are the problem. Talk about a murderer, the person who comes to your mind, a drunkard, a rapist, a thief, domestic abuse, sex trafficking, all these things, it's a man that comes to your head. And that's the current state subconsciously that we do have. Never mind that if you go to a brothel, for example, the people who are running a lot of brothels, 
are actually ladies. Now, this is not a competition of which gender is bad or good. We are just looking at this is the condition. This is the state of manhood in our country at the moment. And below there are a couple of quotes that have been said by a lot of very important people concerning men. Men are a biological necessity, that they are social accidents. They have no role socially, but biologically, we just need to have them. And it was up to us, we would do without them. So you need a man to have babies. And other than that, you can do everything by yourself. Man's role is uncertain, undefined, and perhaps unnecessary. And then the most common one is anything a man can do, a woman can do better. So what's the point of then? I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that, but because we are trying to rush through this, I want to jump and ask the same question. What's the state of womanhood in Uganda? Now that we have an idea of what, what, what I'm talking about when I say the state of manhood, what's the state of womanhood in Uganda? Just two people real quick and then we go to the next slide. We are in a state of liberation and emancipation and empowerment. Mm -hmm. Women are emancipated, empowered, there's increased freedom. Anyone else? Someone here is saying fear women. That is the state of woman in Uganda. We are in a state of fearing them. Some people have recommended that we set up a national holiday just to fear women. Why are we fearing women? Are we fearing their liberation and their freedom and empowerment? What's the issue? Um, thank you. I think uh, I would say the state of women in Uganda is women are untrusted, they are consumers, and probably that explains that state of saying fear women, mostly from what- They are consumers. Are untrusted. They are not trusted and they are consumers. Aha. Uh -huh. This is why I wish this was, you know, uh, an in-person session. Maybe we'll organize a retreat for you guys sometime soon. But so the state of womanhood, um, this is what I would say on the surface, it's better than men. Women are doing better than men. They are better people. However, I'll point out women tend to carry their brokenness differently from men. What we've looked at in the previous slide, the symptoms of the brokenness of men, because men are not living, are leaving out a wrong definition. And by the way, kids are lo looking around, growing up, seeing this state of manhood and understanding that's the template we are following. That's who men are. And some of them are not happy with the conditions, so they live their lives trying to prove that no, that is not what men are. So the definition has been provided. You either live up to it or you try to fight it. On the women's side, their brokenness is usually different. It's, it's more of an inner turmoil than an outer one. Men will show their brokenness by lashing out through violence, for women it's more internal. Women tend to have an in-case plan. Senteze Chikazi was a statistic that came out recently from HR practitioners around the country. And it was talking about how if you're filling out your HR forms, whether it's for insurance or medical or anything like that, 99% of men put their spouse as their emergency contact or as their next of kin they'll either put their spouse or they'll put their mother, especially if they are not married. 20% of women put their spouse, including the married women. They do not put their spouse as their next of kin or their emergency contact. A lot of them will put a sister or a parent, but it will not be the, the spouse. A lot of them have side account, they have an in-case plan because there is no trust in this man who's coming up. They are rising up after all this mistreatment they've had. They have more money, the things you are talking about, more money, more power, more freedom, more careers, more opportunities. But for some reason, it has not translated into increased peace, increased joy, increased fulfillment. And in spite of all this liberation going on, a lot of women are still viewed as sex objects and baby makers. Now, I want this next session to be a lot more interactive because we're going to have to fill out something here on the screen. So when we talk about a man, 
What is a man? When you say a man, we all it seems like a very basic, very simple question. And some of you have already started answering it in, in one way or another. But when you say a man, what do you mean? Becky says a male human being. Okay. So a man uh, is put up a hand. Uh, either one works. I'm just going to be writing your responses real quick. Anyone else? Moses says an adult biological male. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. No, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> um, a man is um a male, a human being that mm -hmm. is above eighteen years of age. Yeah, and um. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, is biologically fully developed to make decisions on their own. Biologically fully developed to make decisions on their own. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? You're also allowed to speak on behalf of others because there might be people who you've had say certain things, but you don't believe them, but you're saying for a friend. Uh, Serena says a responsible adult male. Uh, yeah. In some, Bambi, from what I've heard, some people say, okay, in such a definitions, men are defined as a person who is married and has a home and is capable of siring children. Yes. Sorry for those who can't understand Uganda, but yes, in essence, that's it. So you're taking us into a territory we're also going to go into because whereas a lot of us will agree with the first two definitions, the truth of the matter is sometimes there are men we meet and we feel they are more men than the other men. They have more man in them than other men. So they are closer to that proper, proper, real than these other ones who are just males. So what is that that categorizes you as a man or a real man? You can throw those in as well. In Bugisu, a real man is then who is circumcised. Hmm? Uh, if you're not, you remain a boy. That's among the Bugisu. Okay. I've seen someone say has to have money to give out. If you don't say them, I will make I'll mention some of them which I've heard you guys throw around. Is it the same as being a provider? So it has to be a provider. We even teach that in church. A man provides. So he there are also some attributes like uh he an expectation on strength. Like I mean that is body build. You should be able to carry around heavy stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. If you um, don't have strength, they say you're like you're weak, like a woman. Like a woman, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, you should be a, a staring children. Was already mm -hmm. said, but I was going to say some bit of sexual prowess is expected also. You, 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 you know how to. You know. If you're not performing, given that your organ is called your manhood, isn't it? Yeah. If it's not functional, you're not a man. What else? Absolutely. We know what the culture is, we know what we see. Let me hit at I... some low hanging fruit. You Current have to most be a recent decision maker. decision maker. Yes. And if you're, if you're your indecisive, they say you're being like a woman. 
which I think ultimately also is a cousin to leadership, being able to lead and steward your home. You have to be a leader. Yeah, and if you fail, that's when they say that um, kazam was his, uh, yom waka, uh, was there, you know, making the decisions and leading. Yeah. I was talking about going on about beards and the beard gang. And men who don't have a full proper beard, your boys, then the ones, you know, I will not mention names, who are even going to the saloon to just show their... <clears throat> Anything else I want to add to this list? I see a man is a risk taker. The chat is on fire. I wish Natasha would be reading so I don't have to keep going there. Risk taker. Uh, most of what we've said really, uh, risk taker and always providing uh, Claudia says she appreciates inner muscle too. Uh, and inner then muscle, inner so muscle, has to have uh, inner inner strength, muscle eh? as children. Mm. I know Molimonezi degree. You have to have a job, you have to have a job. Yes, mm. Mm. there's also yeah. this thing about men drive maniocas mm. the motor can such. Yeah, and automatic ones have to be big. And Rita says they don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. They are not emotional. Yes, then there's a common element of kusajalata. Like you have to have multiple partners in um let me say relationship context, romantic relationship mm -hmm. context, yes. That's why, yes. That's why they're always teaching women how to keep your man because you don't keep him, he will go out. But we are really talking about how to keep the woman because the woman will be loyal, the man has to be contained. Hmm? They are there, you guys just need to come out and see them. We are having very frank, honest discussions. Some of you, you'll be driving your vids when you come and park at the family function next to other people's land cruisers. Then they put you in charge of parking instead of taking you behind the man who is not at the same level as the rest. So they don't cry, they're not emotional. Um, I want us to jump from this. If we had more time, we would have gone into that. I want us to leave the men real quick and talk about the women. What's the woman? Let's make this as quick, quick, quick as possible. I can fill them out for you if you don't keep them. A woman is I know what you're going to say. In the adult, I know that one's going to come. Uh, a mother, a woman is a mother. If you don't bear kids, what kind of woman are you? Mm -hmm. Natural. Natural, yeah. Of course, the, the opposites of many of the things we said about men, they should be like homekeepers as well. What kind of woman are you if you don't know how to look after your home? Yeah. How to like they should children. be they're expected to be emotional. If you are very hard to call like a man, they're calling home such a... If you don't like children, what sort of woman are you? You automatically are supposed to like children. Someone yeah. said women are delicate. Delicate. Also, our Talina hips. Bambi, we are they struggling. Have hips. Mm, we're struggling. <laughs> the hustle is and, real. And cubs. Not masculine, oh, muscular. Eh, hey, the muscles are popping. Um, mm. you have to like color, color, 
more pink or red. We should be married at a certain age. That's from the uh the chat. Should be like baby. At a certain age, but you you're longing and looking forward to marriage. Marriage is a big thing for you. Yes, it should be. It should be on your mind. Yeah, it should be eager to join the institution. Um, enjoy color. Mm -hmm. There's another message. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you should know how to cook. You should be loving how to cook. You should be humble, submissive. Aha! Uh -huh. Hey! Submissive, yes. That one's Someone big in the church. Submissive. Humble and submissive. Yes. You should be very clean. The home manager. Support you. Was, to some of these, we don't have time to put the them up. But we, even for men, one of the common things is a guy is not supposed to be too clean. Like people start doubting your sexuality. Um, someone has said organized. Um, yes, that's Isaac. Women can cook. So this can go on and on and on, right? But we are running out of time. So here is my question. All of these, some of them we believe them, some of them we think we don't believe them, right? I want to jump out of this and just pivot to our question about worldview and what I said. Number one, whoever provides definitions controls you. And so I want us to think back, and this is sort of homework for us, who defined manhood and womanhood for you? Okay. Who painted the picture in your mind of what a man is supposed to be and what a woman is supposed to be? And what did they say? Because a lot of them didn't say anything. They either demonstrated it or they implied it. And what you'll be looking at is how does that affect marriage, your career, your parenthood, social life, or your development? I usually define worldview as the mafia. And this is what I mean when I say the mafia. If we go back to these definitions we provided. Usually the first two, human male above 18, adult biological male, is what we were taught in school. What we are trying to live up to is not to be a biological male adult above 18. That one you really have no control over. Time will pass and you'll hit 18. And your body will grow whether you like it or not, and now you're an adult biological male. But what you're trying to live up to as a definition is all these things that are listed down. You've hit a certain age, you're not married. What are you up to? You're under pressure. You're a certain age, you're still in your parents' home, you're supposed to have your own home. You're married, you've not yet had kids. So even if you're not married, at least have kids. Be a real man. For some, you're circumcised. For some, you're not. Do you have money? Are you strong or are you weak? Same thing also applies for women. And the pressure is clear across and that is what I call the mafia. The mafia usually are not in the official position of power, but they are actually the ones controlling what happens around you. We all know those prefects we had in school who were in charge, but there's always that kid who can start a riot for the whole school and doesn't have any official position. And even in our lives, a lot of us are trying to either live up to these definitions, or we are trying to prove that these definitions are wrong. Mm -hmm. If they say you're supposed to be married by a certain age for you to be a woman, you're like, sure, according to who? For me, I'm going to stay single and I'm going to prove that I can be single and happy. And you're trying to fight that definition. And all of these things that are providing these definitions for us are what we would call authority figures. We've not had time to get into what the authority figures are. But these authority figures range everything from our parents to the media, to the church, to our pastors, to our education system, to the government, because the government will dictate, hey, a man is this, a woman is that, and you have to live up to that. They'll say when you hit 18, we consider you an adult male capable of making your decisions. And that's what you're going to live according to. What your parents have brought you up teaching you, all these become authority figures. The question I want us to, to leave us with so that we can jump quickly into question and answer is these scriptures that I want us to read. One's Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. 
says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. In other words, Mark 7, verse 8 to 9, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding human traditions. Continues to say, you have a fine way of setting aside commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. First Corinthians mm -hmm. seven twenty three also says, you are bought at a price, do not become bond servants of men. John is talking about abiding in my word, then you're my disciples, you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. So I want to make a couple of observations and then I'll open it up to questions. A lot of us have a worldview, and a worldview is what actually controls you more than what you profess. You could read the Bible all you want, and usually one of the best examples we use for worldview is you read the Bible and talk about all these things that you believe, but what's actually controlling your life and the decisions you make is your worldview. A lot of us in our cultures, we know about an old, an example I like to use, Everyone talks about the different beliefs around an old. You have it on your roof, it's a bad omen, it's this, it's the other. Usually when we are teaching this, even with pastors, we ask them what their view is of an old, and they're like, nah, that's superstition. It has no power, no control over us. Okay, what happens if it goes on? And they're like, oh, me, I don't believe in that stuff. I just cover myself in the blood. I pray and all is well. Question is then, if it has no power, why are you praying? That's the part. Because somewhere at the back of your mind, there is some little bit of something in there. And we usually have these statements like, you know what, let's first put aside Bible things and deal with real life, with the real world. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, baptized, I'm born again, but I, I need to get married by this age, or I need to grow my beard, or I need to be humble, I need to do this or that. And very few of us look into what caused us to believe that. Edition. What caused us to believe that worldview? And we've listed all of them, we've talked about the media, parents, blah, blah, all of that. But I want to draw attention to two major ones that we very, very rarely think about. If you can write them down, because we'll pick it up from there next time. Number one of them is our own experiences. We've been through an experience, usually it's a traumatic. And as human beings, our result or our reaction to traumatic experiences is we make a vow. Something happens to you and you swear. You say, I will never do this again, or I will never allow this to happen to you. And that becomes a guiding point for you in your life, in spite of your faith and your belief and all of that. Have this decision. This is a vow I have made. This is how I'm going to be living my life because of this traumatic experience that I went through. And the other one is our fear. Things that we are scared of that guide and direct the way our lives go through. Oh, I've seen all these billboards. Men are dogs. Women are not trustworthy. They will do this. And you start organizing your life around those things, either your own experience or fear because of what you saw with other people. Those also contribute a huge percentage to our worldviews. The question is, what should be the guiding principle? And practically, how do we follow it? Because we talked about men, but very few of these things that we've listed on what is a man and what is a woman, have we actually got from what would be a proper authority? If we had had time, we would have gone through all those lists and examined perception come from before we start coming around to what should be the proper perception. The proper perception can't be my opinion or your pastor's opinion or the media or even my own experience. You can talk through how your experiences are not trustworthy. What should be the trustworthy thing? It's sort of covered here in this conclusion. But even that's not straightforward because all of us will say, oh, one thing you can trust is God and the word of God or the Bible. But we all read the Bible. We all follow God and we come out with very different opinions of what it should be. And so in our next session, we are going to be looking into, if we get into the Word and into the Bible, how do you tell specifically what God is saying about you being a man or you being a woman? I don't want to preempt that discussion. We'll get into that in our next session. But for now, I want to open it up to questions in the few minutes that we have left.
Thank you so much, Enoch, uh, for that um, discourse, con constructive dialogue. Uh, guys, if you have any question, please raise your hand up. Let it be a question, not a um, thesis. And, and you can unmute and ask. You can also ask in the chat and I will read it out. Uh, the absence of questions means... Thank you so much um, for the presentation. It's been awesome. Um, with respect to the biblical aspect, who is a man? That's what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. We're going to get into that extensively because a lot of times when we are talking about a man, we talk about uh, examples or oh, David, uh, Joseph. We need to be Daniels of this generation. We need to be all of these things. But before we get into what's the biblical definition of a man, the purpose of this is to help you discover that and know how to come to that conclusion. Because if I then answer for you what a biblical definition is of a man, that's me talking, and I am not trustworthy. And to teach you how to understand the word and then let the word speak that to you, such that when I finally come to the end, say so this is what we believe a man is supposed to be, you yourselves will be the ones coming up with those compounds, rather than me tell it to you, because that will just, as my opinion. I also see Rita Nachanzi has a hand raised. I think for me, it's um, appreciation of the reminder of what forms our worldviews because today I was having a discussion with your colleague and she told me, um, you know, uh, you can, like, there's no way you'll be identified as a woman if you never get married or you never have kids. And I just laughed sarcastically in my head. I was thinking, Please educate yourself. <laughs> and it didn't even hit that. Uh, what forms my world, not has, but my worldview as a person that I that I think there is more to life as a woman. Like, you know, in fact, even I, I even she was even telling me scriptures, and I told her, let me tell you, it wasn't Eve who was lonely, it was Adam who needed companionship. So yeah, so it was just a reminder. I've been thinking about it, and I'm like, where do I get all these ridiculous responses? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you so much. And it is very easy, unless we pause for a moment. Remember what I said about definitions. We're either leaving them out or proving them wrong. But what we want to do now is examine them and figure out what does the word of God actually say? Because every one of us can find a scripture to support whatever our view is. I can find a scripture to support that women should be submissive. I can find a scripture to support that all men should be circumcised. Men should be strong. Men should be providers. Men should be this. Women should be that. So scripture to back all of it. But what is the Bible actually saying? And for us, how have these worldviews affected where we are living out our lives? From small things like how do I dress? How do I talk? What jobs can I do? It's based on that foundation of our worldview of who we are as a man or as a woman. It's very important that we're able to examine those critically and see what God has to say about them. Natasha, you have a hand up. Um, Elijah asked in the chat, how can we identify personal worldviews that are masked? Uh, those which look Christian, but I really not. And I think it points to one of the questions that was asked earlier where we're saying there are some things that are divergent from what is Christian. In order for you to tell something that's divergent, you have to know what the real thing is. It's like the example they talk about uh, people who catch forgeries in the bank. They don't spend their time 
examining all the different types of latest forgeries of notes there. What they do is they spend so much time studying the original note, but what it's supposed to be, such that when you bring a forged note, without even telling what's wrong with it, they know that this is not the original. What we want to be able to focus on is teaching us what the original is, because in future we don't know where this conversation goes, but sort of masked world views come, and there are very many. I can give my personal testimony of one of the very strong pillars I used to have in my life was to make sure I always keep my promises. It wasn't until I was doing this course very many years ago, 10, 12 years ago, that I realized that for us it was a good thing. The foundation of it was my own personal trauma because of an incident that had happened with my dad where he did not keep a promise he made and I vowed to myself I'll always be a man who keeps his word. It means my dad never kept his word. He kept it for so many things, but this particular one was so important to me and he didn't realize it and he broke his word and I was like, for me, I'll always be a man of my own. I started going to very ridiculous lengths just to keep my word in ways that were not even healthy. And so what was guiding me was that and I could find backing for it in the scripture, but is that what Christ had called me to be as a man? And so it can be difficult to identify them, but it becomes important for you to know what is the true north, what is what the word says, what is what God says that man is supposed to be. That's what we'll be examining in the next sessions. But right now it was to bring us an awareness of the situation we are dealing with because it's pointless sometimes to bring people solutions when they they don't realize there's even a problem in the past. We have a lot of Christians living out their brokenness, pastors, leaders, all of these things because they are trying to live up to a definition. They are trying to prove a definition. Um, all right. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> our time is first spent, uh, like four minutes far. And if there's, uh, I think we only have room for like one more tiny, tiny question. Anyone? Anyone? Um, all right. Uh, um, thank you so much, Enoch, for the insightful discussion. I think uh, we've been able to identify the things we take for granted as uh, this thing defining us. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I believe uh, if we haven't, if you haven't learned anything, you have at least been, uh, your mind has been opened to think through certain attitudes towards yourself, people of your gender, people of the opposite gender, and things that happen often that you had not given a lot of thought in the way that um, Enoch has helped us understand. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to hand over now to uh, Moses Wandeva. Uh, our fellowship is led by the Fresh Chair, and the fresh face, <laughs> Moses Wandeba and Becky Iga. So I'd like to invite either of them to close this fellowship and also invite if Uncle Paul is ready to lead us in our closing prayer. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks, Natasha, for leading us and moderating us very well uh, through this session. And and to Enoch for, I believe he has opened a few eyes, he has tickled a few people, ruffled a few feathers, and it's good that we are going to have many more sessions of this. In the beginning, so we'd have four sessions. Uh, so to those who have attended today, I believe you've, it's just like it has whetted your appetite for the next one. And we hope that we'll be seeing all of you for the next one, plus other people also. There is a lot to learn from this. I remember when we went through this at at the camp that we had at Musana, 
at Mosana camps last end of last year. We had yeah very limited time, but it was a uh, it was good and it's different when you go through it even another um again. So we thank you enough for taking us through that. We can't wait for the next ones. We do have our mentorship series every other week. So we will be having our next one on 5th of next month, on Tuesday, 5th of next month. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for, for it. Um, also thanks to our to Paul for hosting us and I ask that he'll say a closing prayer for us if he can not is right. oh yes can. thank you thank you uh, Mose Enoch thank you thank you for bringing uh, this topic to us um that's who listened to it before it's still refreshing being able to hear these concepts again and again. So thank you. Thank you so much for, um, it's amazing how you pulled off the interaction on Zoom. And uh, we celebrate you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you because you love us and you give us definitions. You made us. And Lord, irrespective of what we go through, irrespective of what the world says, we can always come back to you to tell us who we are. So Lord, thank you for this uh, start of this series. I pray that by the end, each of us will have this confidence, this uh, assurance, this place of security in who we are in you and in our functionality by the design you've given each one of us. Lord, I pray for each one, every member on this call, whoever has been uh, wounded, whoever has been broken uh, by any wrong definition, whoever is under a lot of pressure. Uh, we see in the Bible when Martha is so uh, anxious over so many things because of the pressure of our day. Lord, I pray for that sense of peace, security in who we are in you. I pray for that uh, over each one of us. May you bless us as we go along through the week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, I'd like us to share the words of Grace, uh, you could unmute and be say in chorus, either grace of Allah and, and, and the love of God and, 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 and the love of the Holy Spirit be now and forever. Amen. 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 Amen.